Welcome back to the Revolution in Ideology podcast. I'm Jared. I'm Nick. And today we are going to talk about the Fourth World War and how it's begun. So we've been talking a lot about the Zapatistas uh, lately on our channel because they are one of our favorite revolutionary movements of the modern era. They're one of actually considered the first post-structural revolutionary movement um, in world history for a host of reasons. If you'd like to know, do a little research on your own, or you can go back and, and, and look at our historical context video about the Zapatistas. Um, but today we're going to talk about one of the more important things that they're able to accomplish, and that's through their spokesperson, Subcomandante Ancerente Marcos, and that's develop narrative. We've already done an episode on one of the more fictional creative stories that Marcos wrote. Uh, it's called A Glass to See to the Other Side. Today we're going to talk about one of his more political treatises. It's called The Fourth World War Has Begun. So without further ado, I think I'm just going to go right into uh, at least reading the intro part, and then we'll talk a little bit about the pieces of a puzzle that he talks about regarding solving the problems of neoliberal capitalism on a global scale. Any comments before we go? No. Okay. All right. So he begins, the Fourth World War has begun. As a world system, neoliberalism is a new war for the conquest of territory. The ending of the Third World War, meaning the Cold War, in no sense means that the world has gone beyond the bipolar and found stability under the domination of a single victor. Because while there was certainly a defeat to the socialist camp, it's hard to say who won. The U.S., the EU, Japan, all three? The defeat of the evil empire has opened up new markets, and the struggle over them is leading to a new world war, the Fourth. Like all major conflicts, the war is forcing national states to redefine their identity. The world order seems to have reverted to the earlier epochs of the conquests of America, Africa, and Oceania. A strange modernity, this, which progresses by going backwards. The twilight years of the 20th century bear more of a resemblance to the previous centuries of barbarism than to the rational future described in science fiction novels. Vast territories, wealth, and above all, a huge and available workforce lie waiting for the world's new master. But while there's only one position as master on offer, there are many aspiring candidates. And that explains the new war between those who see themselves as part of the empire of good, in quotes, Unlike the Third World War, in, World War, in which the conflict between capitalism and socialism took place over a variety of terrains and with varying degrees of intensity, the Fourth World War is being conducted between major financial centers and theaters of war that are global in scale and with a level of intensity that is fierce and constant. This ineptly named Cold War actually reached very high temperatures, from underground workings of international espionage to the interstellar space of Ronald Reagan's famous Star Wars, from the sands of the Bay of Pigs in Cuba to the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, from the frenzy of the nuclear arms race to the vicious coup d'etat in Latin America, from the menacing maneuvers of NATO armies uh, to the machinations of the CIA in Bolivia, where Che Guevara was murdered. The combination of all this led to the socialist camp being undermined as a world system and to its dissolution as a social alternative. The Third World War, which showed the benefits of total war for its victor, which was capitalism. In the post-Cold War period, we see the emergence of a new planetary scenario in which the principal conflictual elements are the growing importance of no man's lands, arising out of the collapse of the Eastern Bloc countries, the expansion of a number of major powers, the US, the EU, and Japan, a world economic crisis, and a new technical revolution based on information technology. Thanks to computers and the technological revolution, the financial markets operating from their offices and answerable to nobody but themselves have been imposing their laws and a worldview on the planet as a whole. Globalization is merely the totalitarian extension of the logic of finance markets to all aspects of life. Where they were once in command of their economies, the nation states are commanded, or rather telecommanded, by the same basic logic of financial power, commercial free trade. And in addition, this logic has profited from a new permeability created by the development of telecommunications to appropriate all aspects of social activity. At last, a world war which is totally total. One of its first victims has been the national market. Rather like a bullet fired inside a concrete room, the war unleashed by neoliberalism ricochets and ends by wounding the person who fired it. One of the fundamental bases of the power of the modern capitalist state, the national market, is wiped out by the heavy artillery of the global finance economy. The new international capitalism renders national capitalism obsolete and effectively starves their public powers into extinction. The blow has been so brutal that sovereign states have lost the strength to defend their citizens' interests. 
The fine showcase inherited from ending the Cold War, the New World Order, has shattered into fragments as a result of the neoliberal explosion. It takes no more than a few minutes for companies and states to be sunk, but they are sunk not by winds of proletarian revolution, but by the violence of the hurricane of world finance. The sun, neoliberalism, is devouring its father, national capital, and in the process is destroying the lies of capitalist ideology. In the new world order, there is neither democracy nor freedom, neither equality nor fraternity. The planetary stage is transformed into a new battlefield in which chaos reigns. Towards the end of the Cold War, capitalism created a new military horror, the neutron bomb, a weapon which destroys life while sparing buildings. But a new war wonder has been discovered as the Fourth World War unfolds, the finance bomb. Unlike the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this new bomb does not simply destroy the polis, in this case the nation, and bring death, terror, and misery to those who live there. It also transforms its target into a piece in the jigsaw puzzle of the process of economic globalization. The result of the explosion is not a pile of smoking ruins or thousands of dead bodies, but a neighborhood added to one of the commercial megapo uh, megalopolises of the new planetary hypermarket, and a labor force which is reshaped to fit in, its, in with its new planetary job market. The EU is a result of this Fourth World War. In Europe, globalization has succeeded in eliminating the frontiers between rival states and, be, uh, and been enemies for that had been enemies for centuries and has forced them to converge towards political union. On the way from the nation state to the European Federation, the road will be paved with destruction and ruin. And one of these ruins will be that of European civilization. Megapolises are reproducing themselves right across the planet. Their favorite spawning ground is in the world's free trade areas. In North America, NAFTA, between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, is a prelude to the accomplishment of the old dream of U.S. conquest. America for the Americans. Are megapolises replacing nations? No, no. Rather merely, not rather, mere, not, not merely that, they are assigning them a new function, new limits, and new perspective. Entire countries are becoming departments of the neoliberal mega-enterprise. Neoliberalism thus produces, on the one hand, destruction and depopulation, and on the other, the reconstruction and reorganization of regions and nations. Unlike nuclear bombs, which had a massive, dissuasive, intimidating, and coercive character in the Third World War, the financial hyperbombs of the Fourth are different in nature. They serve to attack territories by the destruction of material bases of their sovereignty, and by producing a qualitative depopulation of those territories. This depopulation involves the ex exclusion of all persons who are of no use to the new economy. But at the same time, the financial centers are working on a reconstruction of a nation states and reorganizing them with a new logic. The economic has the upper hand on the social. The indigenous world is full of examples illustrating this strategy. Ian Chambers, director of the Central America section of the International Labor Organization, has stated that the worldwide populations of indigenous people lives in zones which house 60% of the planet's natural resources. It's therefore not surprising that there are multiple conflicts over the use and future of their lands in relation to the interest of business and governments. The exploitation of natural resources and tourism are the principal industries threatening indigenous territories in America. And then come pollution, prostitution, and drugs. In this new war, politics as the organizer of the nation-state no longer exists. Now politics serves solely in order to manage the economy, and politicians are now merely company managers. The world's new masters have no need to govern directly. National governments take on the role of running things on their behalf. This is what the new order means. Unification of the world into a single market. States are simply enterprises with managers in the guise of governments. And the new regional alliances bear more of a resemblance to shopping malls than political federations. The unification produced by neoliberalism is economic. In the giant planetary hypermarket, it's only commodities that circulate freely, not people. This economic globalization is also accompanied by a general way of thinking. The American way of life, which followed American troops into Europe during the Second World War, then to Vietnam in the 60s, and more recently into the Gulf War, is now extending itself to the planet as a whole via computers. What we have here is a destruction of the material basis of nation-states, but we also have a destruction of history and culture. Okay, so that was Marcos's take on what like neoliberalism is bringing, what the Third World War was, and how neoliberalism is ushering in the full Fourth World War. Before I get into each of the pieces of this puzzle that he describes, I want Nick to begin to like analyze that whole 
analyze and unpack everything. He said a lot there. There was a lot to unpack, and I want to Yeah, I don't know if I can do it all. We might be here for hours, but... Right, but I want you to kind of, like, dig into everything that Marcos talked about here in this prelude to this I mean, the first and most important thing is the how we get to the Fourth World War, right? So in case you missed it, he talks about how the Third World War was actually the Cold War. And I think many people in the West refer to it as the Cold War because it was, right, there was no, like, battles with actual weapons, like, hot weapons, etc., but for the rest of the world, in many, many places, it was a hot war. It was not a cold war. There actually was troops on the ground, and there actually was uh, mass casualties, and there were conflicts yeah, that were fought. millions dead in Korea, and mm-hmm. Vietnam, and Panama, and, you know, even thousands dead, right? Like, I mean, under the rule of Pinochet, which is part of the yeah. cold war. I mean, like, I, I mean, I'm running out of examples. I could go through, I could go all day, but I want Nick to pick off, but, like, kick off what he's talking about. But I do want to emphasize this point. The Cold War for the vast majority of the world was not like just like this cowardly like spy game between the Soviet Union and the United States. And I use that word intentionally, cowardly, between these two superpowers because they were indeed cowardly. But was hot on the ground throughout what we would call the, at the time, and we don't use this term anymore, the third world or the developing world. But that's, I mean, it was super hot. And we overlooked that. It's one of my, the things I hate the most about the Cold War. And I think it's like, yeah. Like, it's not about, like, space. It's not just Sputnik and Apollo. It's, right. It's, yeah. It's, it's it, like, it, it reveals the privilege of the West to be able to call it a, a Cold War, right? Yeah. Like, it, clearly. So that's how we get through now what he's calling the Fourth World War, which is what's going on. He's writing this in the 90s, but it's still continuing. The neoliberal war that's taking place throughout the world. And he obviously gives a detail about that, which just, I mean, this excerpt just illuminates why Marcos is just so incredible because he's capable of writing cute children's stories, right? With Don Dorito, this little beetle that uh, stars in them, like the example that we did the episode on in Mexico City, and capable of writing like philosophical treatises that are just straight fire, um, which I think is interesting. One thing I wanted to note that caught my eye, he talks about the bullet ricocheting and injuring the person that fires it or something. We did an episode on Michel Foucault's concept of biopower. Um, He also has a concept that's called the boomerang of power, the boomerang Mm. effect, which is exactly, I don't know if Marcus is referring to that or not, but he talks about this, how power cannot be wielded in any way that doesn't eventually come back and impact the person who has wielded it. And that's exactly like along the lines of what Marcos is talking about, which is interesting. Well, he even talks about like how the father is now, or the son is now devouring the father. Mm-hmm. Like neoliberal capitalism, this new like whatever, however we want to frame it, like it's framed differently in different places. But this new neoliberal globalization version of capitalism is now actually eating its original like Adam Smith pure version of capitalism. Like that's gone now. So yeah, people exactly. that, that talk about like free market and rising tides and so on and so forth, they're talking in language that no longer even exists anymore. That version that pure version of capitalism, we can debate whether it is effective or not. Yeah, that's, that's, that's completely been superseded yeah. by this new advanced industrial society. It's that, like the Frankenstein, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Which, there. like, people celebrate Adam Smith for, like, you know, the things that he did, and, like, that's fine. Economists and political scientists and so on. But he not at all is referring to the capitalism that exists today. Yeah, he's right over in his grave at this point in time. And and we're not even capitalists, as you all can tell from our channel. But, like, yeah, yeah he's rolling over in his grave at this exactly. point in time. What about this uh, idea that politicians um, at all levels, all levels, all the way on up to the executive level at, mm-hmm. at, on national scales, are, aren't even real politicians or leaders anymore. They're merely company managers. Yeah, what about this that? is such a good metaphor, and I love it, because uh, as I think everyone knows, or they should, I guess, uh, corporations run politics, definitely in the United States, right? And it's the United States that is the imperialist power at this point. Uh, that's going into places like Mexico as a result of NAFTA, if you watched our episode on the history of the Zapatistas, that are doing these things, right? So, yeah, he's basically saying, the politicians, he specifically says, the politicians are now doing the jobs of, like, the corporate CEOs. They don't have to work anymore. The politicians will go into uh, and colonize countries and restructure trade agreements and local politics in wherever they are entering so that the corporations can function. The CEOs don't even have to do that anymore. The politicians are not doing it for them. I left this out of the intro, but can I just like remind both Nick and our viewers, he wrote this in the 90s, like mm-hmm. 1996 and 90, through 97. Like, how forward thinking was he in his yeah. deconstruction of what was taking place? You know? I mean, it only got worse, right, in the past 30 years, for sure. 
Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Anything else you want to cover from this like prelude before we dig into again this? He refers to this. His metaphor in this case is a puzzle. There are mm-hmm. like different pieces that create this neoliberal nightmare. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to no, talk about? So. We're good. So Marcus's mes- metaphor of a puzzle has seven pieces. Um, those that know a little bit about the Zapatistas know seven is a wildly important number in 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 Mayan. Uh, mythological and social understanding of the world but we won't go into that right now but it's probably why he chose seven pieces as like this this puzzle that just doesn't fit together regarding neoliberal capitalism so we want to go through each piece as he kind of like describes it i'm not going to necessarily read them verbatim like i did like the prelude and then i want to kind of get nick's thoughts on what he's talking about here like these are the seven puzzle pieces of neoliberal capitalism on a global scale the first piece is the piece, um, if he, as he describes it, is the money sign. So this puzzle piece is shaped like a dollar sign, basically. By the way, these pieces don't like fit together, right? Like, yeah, it, I mean that's the metaphor. metaphor that's right, the point, right, right? And we'll talk yeah. about why he says that here in a second. But like, so it's a, it's a dollar sign. Picture a dollar sign. The con- and he describes this as the concentration of wealth and the distribution of poverty. That's piece number one. Now, I, again, I want to go back and, and state that he said this back in the 90s, so his data here is going to be a little bit dated, but it still kind of gets the point home. He says the Earth has 5 billion human inhabitants. Of these, only 500 million live comfortably. The rainy, remaining 4.5 billion endure lives of poverty. The rich make up for their numerical minority with their ownership of billions of dollars. The total wealth owned by the 358 richest people in the world, the dollar billionaires, is greater than the annual income of almost half the world's poorest inhabitants. In other words, 2.6 billion people. Those numbers have only gotten exponentially worse since the 90s when he wrote this. And of course, there's a lot more than, than 5 billion people um, on the planet now. Um, he also goes on to say that the richer these giant companies become, the more poverty there is in so-called wealthy countries as well. He's arguing that it's not just a problem for the globally poor, that even in these quote unquote, we would call first world or developed or industrial nations, we're seeing a wealth gap, um, grow there. And as the sociologist, you know, the United States is experiencing the largest wealth gap in human history right now. What are your thoughts on this first puzzle piece? I mean, starts. again, it shows just sort of how forward-thinking he was that, like, he's pointing this issue out in the 90s, and it's just got exponentially worse in the 30 years since, uh, and it clearly reveals his Marxist, I was going to say tendencies, as if he wasn't a Marxist, his Marxist uh, philosophy, uh, yeah, clearly, um, yeah, like you said, it's just gotten worse. Like you said, we are in the worst economic inequality in human history right now. And that's not hyperbolic, no matter what statistic you look at, right. that's the truth. Um, so, and I think your point is valid when he's talking about how it's not just a quote unquote third world countries, right? Which is oftentimes what we think here in the West. It's like, well, I mean, they are, they're poor there as a result of colonization and, and so on. But like his point is that it's everywhere that this inequality that capitalism creates, no one can escape it. Even in the wealthiest countries, even they themselves experience just rampant inequality as a result of capitalism. It's local, it's global, it's everywhere. Yeah, and it's a disease. It's the first piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. The second piece is a triangle. Uh, One of my favorite pieces. Uh, You can go back and check out our our, uh, episode on social hierarchy. But like this is where part of that comes from. He argues that the globalization of exploitation is the triangle piece. That's how he describes it. The globalization of exploitation. So in other words, like all of society pretty soon will be shaped like this giant pyramid where there are haves and have nots and like the base is completely exploited by those above us. Uh, For those that haven't watched like that little short clip that that I created or our episode on social hierarchy at the very top, you have leadership right below them. You have a storytelling class that rationalizes why leadership is where they were are where they are and why everyone else is stuck in exploitation. And below them, you have a layer of enforcers that basically enforce the stories that are being told about why life isn't fair. And then everybody else is fractured into some form of of labor. Uh, Marx would call it the proletariat. And most people are unaware of their life status as proletariat, but that's what labor is and we're divided on racial lines or national lines or ethnic lines or gender lines or sexuality lines or even trivial lines like what sport team sports teams we like but like that's kind of like that pyramid what do you think of this being the next natural piece of neoliberalism is taking the pyramid structure that we know we talk about and then making it global i think it's interesting that he talks about this hierarchy at a global level and i think it 
I don't know if he read this or not, um, but I think it points to work of a sociologist by the name of Emmanuel Wallerstein, and it's the world systems approach or world systems theory. His theory is basically that historically nations have been received their point in the global hierarchy by how fast they industrialized and how close they were to the industrialized nations. So the core nations, which are like uh, the United States and the UK and Germany, the nations that industrialize first, those are the core nations, and they are very clearly at the top of this sort of hierarchy. Then we have the peripheral nations, who are the ones that like geographically are sort of the closest to the core nations, and they are, you know, the next rung down. Then we have the semi-periphery, who are the next sort of thing of these as like concentric circles, mm -hmm. and they are less developed and so forth. We would call the quote-unquote third world, right, is kind of what this term uh, is used in this context. So I think it relates, right? This is this global hierarchy based on industrialization, based on military power, based on quote unquote wealth and so forth. But does he talk about like the only reason those nations became the core nations is because they were founded on exploiting others, oh, yeah, especially sure. in the global south, right? Mm -hmm. Like like the US and the UK and Germany, these industrial powers didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Yeah. Like that is like one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves mm -hmm. here. We exploited others, whether it was yep. First Nations here in North America, whether it was Sub-Saharan African labor, like it's based on exploitation. And I think one thing that's lost in this idea is even before we get to neoliberal capitalism is these developed nations are only developing because they are recovering from centuries of exploitation yep. by these industrial and powers. And I think something that gets often, often looked over that we don't talk about nearly enough in like U.S. history for sure, but even global history, is the fact that the U.S. became the world power that it became as a result of the other world powers being completely decimated by World War II. Yeah. That the United decided, States yeah. was the only one that didn't have damage on a local level, not including Hawaii, right? But, like, if you look at pictures from London after World War II, it's completely destroyed. Yeah, imagine trying to rebuild, does not exist. rebuild New York City yeah. or D.C. or Philly or something like that. The United like States that, didn't yeah. have to do any of that. Even the Soviets, the other world power, actually also had to compete. They were also competing with the United States and having to rebuild. Exactly. Stalingrad and Moscow and, yeah, yeah Petrograd and, yeah, so anyway. All right, moving on. Okay, <laughs> the third piece to this puzzle is, is uh, a circle. So, so far we have a dollar sign, a triangle, and now we have a circle. This circle is uh, uh, identified as the migration, a nightmare of wandering. And this is one of my favorites because he was so predictive here. Uh, essentially, what he's saying is because of like the spread of neoliberalism. In fact, let's just use his words, right? He says the situation involves financial centers and a threefold strategy. There's a proliferation of regional wars and internal conflicts. Capital follows paths of atypical accumulation and large masses of workers are mobilized. The result is a huge rolling wheel of millions of migrants moving across the planet. As foreigners in that world without frontiers, which has been promised by the victors of the Cold War, they are forced to endure racist persecution, precarious employment, the loss of their cultural identity, police repression, hunger, imprisonment, and murder, and holy shit, he nailed this. Absolutely in the 90s. Mm -hmm. He's talking, obviously, most specifically about migrant workers coming from where he's from, Mexico, probably into the United States or Canada, or some even going south, or even others from the south going into Mexico, like Guatemalans and Hondurans and so on and so forth. That's what he's talking about, like how these, like, these financial decisions are being made, and it leads to... Basically, people that are stateless, like constant migration, this 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 very unsustainable life of wandering. However, however, he also talks about these manufactured regional wars and internal conflicts over resources, like we see um, in the Western Mediterranean in places like Syria or Iraq or whatever that 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 happened after he said this, and that has led to mass migration. We now call it a refugee crisis, but he's basically saying refugee crises are the natural byproduct of neoliberal capitalism, and they will never go away. That as long as we follow this economic system of exploitation, there will always be haves and have-nots, and these refugees are then forced to like wander the earth looking for somewhere to call home, and everywhere they end up, they're dealt with these things that we definitely see. Police repression, hunger, loss of identity, racism, persecution, um, shit, literal children in concentration camps on the border between the United States and Mexico is a very, very blatant example right now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think you did do a good job of explaining this in the history of, like, the historical context episode on the Zapatistas of how actions specifically by the United States and the other quote-unquote world powers led specifically to the migration, the immigration crisis in the United States. And, like, we think that, like, this came from nowhere. What, why would they be doing this? Well, like, we caused it, and we don't understand, we don't make the connection between how our 
lives of relative luxury have led to the, like you said, the refugee crises across the globe. Right. Like, like Iraqi refugees exist because of U.S. exploitation. Exactly. Or in Syria, the civil war, the exploitation in this case, we would argue the United States, Russia, and Iran, mm -hmm. in this case, all playing a role in creating this mass refugee crisis. Turkey. Yeah. yeah, Turkey. We really can't let them off the hook. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. The fourth piece to this um, completely unsustainable puzzle or, or puzzle that doesn't fit together is a rectangle. So a dollar sign, triangle, circle, now a rectangle. Financial globalization and the generalization of crime. This is one of my favorites. Uh, he says, if you think that the world of crime has to be shady and underhanded, you're wrong. In the period of the so-called Cold War, organized crime acquired a more respectable image. Not only did it begin to function in the same way as the other modern enterprise, but it also penetrated deeply into the political and economic system of nation states. With the beginning of the Fourth World War, organized crime has globalized its activities. The criminal organizations of five continents have taken on board the spirit of world cooperation and have joined together in order to participate in the conquest of new markets. They're investing in legal businesses, not only in order to launder dirty money, but in order to acquire capital for illegal operations. They, their preferred activities are luxury property investment, the leisure industry, the media, and banking, and on and on and on. So basically what he's saying is like crime is now, and we already knew this, crime is framed by those that have privilege and power, mm -hmm. right? There is no moral or ethical rhyme or reason to the way we think of crime in any society aside from some pretty big ones like murder and maybe rape and things along those lines. But in terms of like, crime i always use this like this this uh, metaphor in my classes when we talk about crime and why we think about it the way it is why is drug dealing considered bad in our society when you deal a certain kind of drugs but not when you're pfizer yeah they're both drug dealers the kid on the street in in queens with like an eighth in his pocket or something like that is a drug dealer pfizer is a drug dealer why does he have to be in queens i don't know i just made that <laughs> up right? like why does it, but that's the point like what <laughs> I mean, we could put them in, like, suburbia yeah, as well. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, but one's picked on more than the other. Let's just be mm -hmm. blunt. But, like, why is one considered a criminal and the other considered, like, a legitimate business? Mm -hmm. That's completely arbitrary, and it's decided by people in positions of power. Both deal drugs. In fact, I would argue Xanax is exponentially worse than pot. But, like, it's framed by those in positions of power, and yeah. that's what he's saying. Like, the... It's the manufacture of crime where crime didn't exist and the legalization of certain crimes for certain people. What yeah, do you think so then in global capitalism, across the world, things that he's saying used to be organized crime that were illegal have now become folded into legal activity. And they're allowed to exploit in ways that before would have been illegal, that they would have gone to prison for, that now is just like the status quo. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I mean, do you think he's right? Like, oh, 100%. Think that... Absolutely. Okay. And he also argues with this whole shape of rectangle that, like, because of, like, this rise in manufactured crime, and that's what it is, right? Like, people in positions of power making up things that are illegal so that they can catch more criminals, like, you see... And the United States is the biggest center of this mass incarceration, mm -hmm. right? And that's one of the biggest byproducts there is and, and it further like draws, delineates the line between haves and have nots. Oh, yeah, there's a reason that we have more people per capita in prison than any other country in the world. Right. That's it. And as we've discussed in other episodes on different topics, why we have more laws than just about any other nation state in the world. Those mm -hmm. laws aren't necessarily about protecting people's freedoms. That's It's the opposite thereof. Yeah. So anyway, all right. The fifth piece to the puzzle is a pentagon. Uh, another shape. Legitimate violence of illegitimate power. In the cabaret of globalization, the state performs a striptease, at the end of which is left wearing the minimum necessary, its powers of repression. With its material base destroyed, its sovereignty and independence abolished, and its political class eradicated, the nation-state increasingly becomes a mere security apparatus in the service of mega-enterprises, which neoliberalism is constructing. Instead of orienting public investment towards social spending, it prefers to improve the equipment which enables it to control society more effectively. Fire. Straight yeah. fire. Basically, he's saying the nation state no longer serves all the functions of a nation state anymore. He already talks about it. It's basically just like there to help businesses. Fine. But the one power it holds is its military power. That's the only thing it still holds on. And it uses that military power to benefit not the people, but who? Corporations. The, the corporations. Yeah. He's writing this before Iraq. He's writing this before Afghanistan, or I should say the invasions thereof. He's like, it's so prescient. What do you think? Like, no, I, yeah, I don't even know if I have anything to add to that one. Like, he nails it. 
And it just becomes true, right? War has been profitable for a while for a lot mm-hmm. of nation states, but what he's saying is that neoliberalism means like it is the only reason now to like to engage in war is yeah. for profit. Yeah, exactly. like, like he said that's what's that's the transfer mm-hmm. in the ideology. He's arguing the only thing that exists at a state level are its powers to repress as well. That could also qualify for its own people, perhaps not calling the National Guard and trying to threaten the U.S. military to shut down protests, yep. as we've seen very recently in um, some of the industrial Yeah, it goes both internally and externally. Internal sure. and external enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, and the militarization of policing forces. Like, all this kind of folds together. Basically, the state only now exists to control individuals, either internally or externally, for profit margins. Yep. Interesting. The sixth piece. Mega politics and its dwarfs is the shape of a doodle. <laughs> Don't ask me what a doodle is. Doodle. Like, it's a doodle. It's the shape of a doodle. Because it's so obscene. We said earlier that nation states are attacked by the finance markets and forced to dissolve themselves with uh, megapolises, but neoliberalism does not conduct its war solely by unifying nations and regions. Its strategy of destruction, depopulation, and reconstruction organization all produces, also produces a fracture or fractures within the nation state. This is the paradox of this Fourth World War. While ostens- ostensibly working to eliminate frontiers and unite nations, it actually leads to a multiplication of frontiers and the smashing apart of nations. He uses some pretty obvious examples like the collapse of the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and the absolutely like violent deconstruction of the former nation state of Yugoslavia into like Croatia and Macedonia and so on and so forth. But you can also see how this is predictive of some of the more developed nations and what we would argue, modern American theorists, especially like white nationalists call it like tribalism or whatever, but we see that here, right? Even in the Scandinavian countries, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, like this, this, this rise in like, again, a kind of a militant white nationalism and all these things are fractures that he predicted. Why? Because it's the inevitable outcome of global capitalism. Well, I want to talk specifically about, like, again, in 2020, like this rise of the of, of yeah, toxic white nationalism is reactionary to these divides that are created. Because I mean, what what are these 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 childish like? these man ch- children, like, what are they so scared of in their little gangs of whatever? Like, yeah. what, because like, that's what he's talking about here. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the surest signs. Like, South Park made the joke, they took our jobs, but it's more than that. They're, they're scared of, like, their loss of their identity or their yeah. culture. Or I mean, their I've always to thought that, <laughs> this is going to be controversial, I've always thought that they're so afraid of their identity being jeopardized because they actually don't have a real identity. Like, the white people that came and colonized the United <laughs> St- what became the United States, like, n- who are you? Like, really? You have, at this point, a 200-year history of being here, and that's your full identity? Like, they're... And that identity is absorbing other cultures? <laughs> exactly. Like, your identity is bullshit, <laughs> and compared to, like, other ethnic groups uh, that have thousands and thousands of years that they can trace their history huh. I- I- existing in other parts of the world much more sustainably, I might add. Um, not that many of them... Uh, a lot of them also weren't violent and so on. But, like, the white identity, specifically in the United States, let's say, like you said, is just built upon exploitation, genocide, colonization. There's no escaping that. What about other forms of fragmentation that he could be talking about? And, again, the United States presents a pretty easy example, as does Mexico, as does Canada, the very clear divide between right and left. Like, that mm-hmm. other that, that divide that used to be, and we make this point all the time, used to be simply a political divide. Like, yeah, we had difference of opinions on, like, what, what, what economics work is. Is it Keynesian? Is it Marx? Is it whatever? Like, yeah, those would be, like, the debates. But now that divide is, like, beyond just, like, cute little political differences. Mm-hmm. There are clear moral and ethical distinctions on both sides, and both would argue that they are the more ethical or moral. So be it. But that is a clear divide. that There is no bridging that gap anymore. I think that, that gap the, is... That, yeah. That's a chasm now. It's not a gap. No, yeah. a I think that it's interesting because the debate has changed both quantitatively and qualitatively. Like, the two sides have gotten further and further and further apart, and the nature of the debate has changed. Like you just said, it used to be like, oh, we can agree, like, disagree economically, but let's go play golf together or whatever. Right. I guess if you're white and rich. Um, <laughs> But, which in which case you're probably on one side of the, the political debate, but that's a whole other topic. Right. Um, but now, like you said, it's become this ethical and moral divide that has much, much more serious ramifications than just like, how much do we turn the dial in the Keynesian, like, you know, economic model, like, etc. It's changed both magnitude and like fundamentally what the debate is about. 
So he predicted this. Yeah. And I think it's, it's the inevitable outcome of the furthering and furthering of the trajectory of the capitalist mode of production. Do we see some more of this fracturing even on sides that would argue they're on the same side? Do we even see like micro fractures in like the far right and the far left? Yeah, it's never ended. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. If you have, it's funny because I'm doing research. I was just telling Jared before we started recording on Antonio Gramsci right now uh, so that we can do some episodes and I'm writing a short book about him. And so I've been reading like the history of the Italian Socialist Party in the 20th century, late 18th, early 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And like, it's so divided. They're constantly like, oh, this, this sect is in power or this faction is in power and like the revolutionary or the reformists and like Lenin's weighing in and all this stuff is happening. I'm like laughing to myself that it's just reflective of every socialist group that I've ever been a part of is just infighting constantly. And the same is true in the right as well. I, we just, we, we fracture ourselves yeah. more than I think that the opponent does. And do you think part of the, the reason we do that, as Marcos is asserting, is this neoliberal, like both material and ideal practice? No, I, I think so. Like individualism and so on, 100%. All right. Final piece to this puzzle that does not fit together that he is drawing for us is the shape of a pocket, a literal pocket. Um, and this represents pockets of resistance. And this is the part that gives us all hope that neoliberalism, because of its inability to fit together, will always have pockets of resistance. Brave, brave people that are willing to resist all of the horrific um, side effects of this globalization process, of which, of course, he played a major role mm -hmm. as the spokesperson of the Zapatistas uh, for decades until he recently retired. Um, another one of our favorite examples that we've done a lot of episodes on, um, the various Kurdish resistance movements from the PKK to the YPJ and so on. So those are pockets of resistance. We see pockets of resistance in, um, Tamil areas of Southeast Asia. We see pockets of resistance in New Zealand. Um, I'm, all, I'm always mis mispronounce it. I'm going to say Maori, although I know that's not pronounced, pro uh, pr 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 pronounced right. Maori resistance movements. We see Black Lives Matter movements here in the West. Like these are pockets of resistance to what's been taking place. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on these pockets no, yeah, of resistance? Just, like, these always, are the there will always be people that are willing to stand up. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a really, really good book that we're going to do an episode on at some point called "Blessed Is the Flame," and it's about anarcho nihilism. But the epis the examples that the author uses, is the the Jews and others that resisted within the concentration camps to sort of prove that no matter how dire things get, that like even literally you know that you will be murdered if you resist, that people still resisted because it was the only thing that they could do to literally feel alive. And so no matter how dire things get, there will always be pockets of resistance. There will be people willing to stand up and fight for what they think is right. And those are the people that we kind of find solace in. Uh, on this podcast and in real life. Mm -hmm. So all of those movements, and we only rattled off a few, but we've talked about it. We have an episode on, on what they're doing in Chandra on Mexico. We, have, mm -hmm. we talk about the Zapatistas, the Cuban revolutionaries, like, the, I mean, Kurds, just the yeah. Kurds, I mean, uh, the Iranian revolutionaries. We've done an episode on them. Like, so yes, this is, this is something that, again, we take solace in and Marcos does as well, but they are one of the other important reasons why this puzzle will never fit together and we're thankful for them, mm -hmm. um, as is Marcos. He concludes by saying, having now drawn, colored, and cut out these seven pieces, you'll notice that it is impossible to fit them together. This is the problem. Globalization has been seeking to put, pieces, put together pieces which don't fit. For this reason and for others which I cannot develop in this article, it's necessary to build a new world. A world in which there is room for many worlds. A world capable of containing all the worlds. And again, one of my favorite quotes of all time, a world in which many worlds exist. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on Marcos? and his discussion of this fourth world war. There's a good book. We used to use it in class. One no, many yeses, right? Mm, yeah. And that's so the, he, they, the author, I can't remember his name He's right now. He's inspired by the Zapatistas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He talks about the Zapatistas a lot and this idea that... Kings North is his name. Yep, you're yeah. right. We'll link to it in the show notes. He writes about how there is one very clear no, which is a no to neoliberalism and global capitalism and this kind of exploitation that Marcus is talking about. And that the world should be open to many yeses, many solutions to, right, this problem. And Marcos talks in those same terms here, how there should be a world where many worlds can exist, where people can live their own lifestyles and their own solutions to this global problem, clearly. 
Yeah, without the impact of the nation state, without the impact of the uh, uh, corporate overlords. Absolutely. So uh, that's all we have. The Fourth World War has begun. Marcos wrote it in the late 90s, I want to say 1997, um, and he predicted 2020 to AT. Sorry, we're dating this episode, but he did. He I guess it, I guess there's nothing about COVID in here, but yeah, yeah. just about everything else. It's here. <laughs> so yeah. Find us online. We're at revolutionandideology.com. We are on Twitter at Rev and Ideology. Um, if you're listening to this as a podcast, make sure and give us a rating and leave a comment and share us with your friends. That will help us to find listeners. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you like the video and leave a comment and subscribe if you haven't already and share us as well. If you really like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon. We are at patreon.com at revolution and ideology. Uh, I'm Nick. Jared. Later.